It's now time for The Sit Down with Don Tony. The Sit Down, where Don Tony talks one on one with his followers. What are you looking at? About the world of pro wrestling, pop culture, and so much more. The Sit Down with Don Tony. And now, your host, Don Tony. I just uh, was chewing on some ice and I forgot I was live. <laughs> What's up, everybody? It is what, August 5th? No, August 6th. August 5th was SummerSlam. August 6th, Sunday night. The sit down is back. I am Don Tony, as always. Much love. Thank you for always tuning in, showing support. Keep spreading the word of what we do. Ah, uh, tell you, SummerSlam last night. And we're not going to do a recap here because a little cheap plug for those that might be interested. Later on tonight, it doesn't end, everyone. Uh, after I'm done with this show today, uh, later tonight at 10 o'clock, Kev Castle and yours truly will be recording a SummerSlam. We don't call it recap and review because that's technically the same thing. We call it a review and the aftermath of SummerSlam because the scenario that Kev Castle and yours truly talked about going back to money in the bank is still in play. And that is the bloodline fatal four way for the undisputed WWE universal championship. So we will talk everything SmackDown, uh, SmackDown raw SummerSlam, um, and what we think is going to transpire next. I know the big buzz today is Jimmy Uso. Um, I don't think everything is what is perceived to be. Everybody immediately thinks, bloodline back in the bloodline and an interview i think the usos did it was at ariel hawani it might have been where they said that their fantasy is to have a match at wrestlemania right away people are doing that the same thing they did about la night winning the money in the bank briefcase without thinking logic first are now doing this with the usos at wrestlemania do I think the Usos will wrestle each other at WrestleMania? It's possible, but that is a long ways away from now. And honestly, I think the further you go away from SummerSlam last night, the more distant Jay and Jimmy Uso are on the food chain. And this is not a knock on Jimmy Uso. But when you really look at the last couple of years, you know, let's be honest, Jey Uso up here, Jimmy Uso maybe down here, not too far down in a second. We think of Jimmy Uso's past troubles. You know, all this comes into account. Plus, it's main event Uso is Jay. We don't hear main event for Jimmy. So I think the longer you keep them apart, the bigger worry that one I know this sounds ridiculous, but one sort of becomes the Marty Jannetty, you know, splitting apart. So, no, I don't think Jimmy Uso returns to the bloodline. I think Jimmy Uso is his own guy. I think he's mad at Roman. I think he's mad at Jay. This is, this is what Kevin and I talked about back in Money in the Bank, that we said that that'll happen later on this year. Maybe a payback, maybe a Survivor Series. Don't know. But uh, I will say this. Last night, SummerSlam was fucking awesome. It was awesome. Um, I see a couple of super chats came in. So without further ado, let's kick this show into gear because we will be ending it at the 75 minute mark. So it gives me time to put this online and I can prepare for the SummerSlam recap a little later tonight. But I do see one of the super chat. Let me give the quick format for maybe someone who is new to this Sunday show. On Sunday, I show up with nothing. It's the laziest show that I do. You, in the live chat, dictate what we talk about tonight. It could be wrestling, non-wrestling, WWE, AEW, doesn't matter. You steer the ship. I am just the messenger. I will give you my thoughts, opinions. If you have a question, just write it in the chat and in capitalize, write the word question so I could spot it quicker. If you have a comment and you want me to share with the world, write comment before you comment. And as always, super chats are never required, but they are appreciated. They help pay the bills. 
because uh, shit is expensive these days, obviously. They'll always get VIP priority. And a couple came in, as they do many times, because people would like their questions answered at the top of the show. So I'm going to get into those first, and then we will uh, hang out in the chat for the next 69 minutes and talk about whatever is on your mind. So uh, keeping on the SummerSlam subject, let's get into this one first. Sticky Fingers Frank, thank you for the five spot. DT, I know you're doing a recap with Kev later, but I wanted to know your favorite and least favorite match from SummerSlam. My favorite was Tribal Combat. My least favorite was the MMA rules match. Um, I am with you on 50%. My least favorite was Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler. Now, I'll say this, and I'm being very respectful when I say this. Um, the match disappointed. And yes, Shayna Baszler legitimately got injured. Not just the mouse, not just the shot that she took to the eye, which was legit. But she either dislocated, hyperextended her elbow. She injured her arm yesterday. And when she was talking to the officials and she was holding her arm, that was 100% legit. So you feel bad because that obviously screwed up any chance of this match gaining any momentum. And I already wrote up the synopsis for the review that we're going to put up later on. And I, and I noted that, but I will say this, and I didn't put this in the synopsis, but I'm going to say this now. You know what I've realized? You know what I've realized? And I know this is going to sound kind of stupid, but I think if you take a step back, you'll agree with me 100%. We know what pro wrestling is in the year 2023. We know that, and, and yes, some of it is blatant. Some of it is recklessness. I always bring up that asshole coach from the Jacksonville Jaguars who's no longer there. Um, you know, MJF and Jericho having this big feud that leads the stadium stampede. And this asshole posts a picture of Jericho and MJF watching the first half of the recorded match. I mean, we know that these guys at the end of the day, yeah, the elite CM Punk, different situation, but we know what pro wrestling is. So the idea, and I, and I really, this really hit me yesterday. The idea that we're going to see something legit. I don't think it fancies, fancies wrestling fans. Like, oh, this is real. They're really punching each other. Pop. No. Wrestling fans know what pro wrestling is. So if somebody starts having a legitimate fight in the middle of the ring, it's not going to excite people like you would think they do. You know why? I'll tell you why. Look at most AEW matches. Look at Roman Reigns versus Jey Uso for the majority of the match yesterday. Look at Logan Paul and Ricochet. The suspension of disbelief is that they are destroying each other. When you connect with a knee to the face and you really connect not for nothing that doesn't impress many people because everything else we see we believe suspension and disbelief that they're connecting as well so no matter what Rhonda and Shayna would have done yesterday unless the moves were on the level of what a pro wrestling move is the exaggeration you know you hit someone with a sledgehammer in real life, their brain is turned into scrambled eggs. You get arrested for attempted murder. In wrestling, they just get knocked out. You know, so it, wrestling is already extremely exaggerated. So when you legitimately fight, it's watered down. And honestly, yesterday, if Ronda Rousey or Shayna Baszler would have fought like that in the octagon, their match would have been over in 30 seconds. They would have gotten their ass kicked. So, yes, for me, that was my least favorite match. My most favorite match, Logan Paul and Ricochet came this close of being it, but I'm going with Cody Rhodes and Brock Lesnar. And the reason why I'm not going with Roman Reigns and Jey Uso is because, number one, there was no face paint. Number two, there was no tribal weapons. Number three, there were no elders. 
And I made a joke. I made a joke on Saturday's Don Tony show that a few of you emailed and DM'd me in the last 18 hours that I thought about. I was like, yeah, I just said it as a joke, but it's actually true. You go back to when Jey Uso proposed tribal combat. And Roman said, do the elders know this? And Jey Uso says, Uso, it was their idea. What did we get yesterday? The joke I said on Saturday. We got the fucking Viking Raiders rules. It was just a no DQ match. There was nothing else. Nothing. That's all it was. So the elders suggested a no DQ. You know, it wasn't tribal combat. It was a no DQ match. I'm not taking anything away from it. I loved it. But go back and watch the beginning of the match. For the first three or four minutes, they're giving each other headlocks. That's what tribal combat is. I used to joke about that in the 90s. If anybody goes back to my hotline days, I used to joke around and I used to say, you know, one of the things that sucked sometimes on TV is you'd have two people in these bitter feud. I'm going to kill you. When I get you in this ring, I'm going to destroy you. And then the first move they do is a headlock. If I want to kill a motherfucker on the street, I guarantee I'm not going to give him a headlock, you know, or an arm drag takedown. And they started off with headlocks yesterday. And I'm like, this is tribal combat. And that kind of set the tone for me. So that's why I go with Brock and Cody as my favorite. To me, I thought it told a better story, although Finn Balor and Seth Rollins was awesome too. You really didn't have a bad match on the card yesterday. Ronda and Shayna never clicked for, for the reasons I just said. But, I mean, honestly, I know this sounds crazy to some people. I think yesterday was probably the, the best SummerSlam in history. And what I mean by that is the number of top-shelf matches. The number of top-shelf matches. Were there other matches that were better? Yes. There were definitely better matches in SummerSlam in its history. But as far as top to bottom, the number of quality matches, I think yesterday might have topped them all. So much love. All right. Steve Joseph, thank you for the two spot. Are the reports true about Trish and Becky? Um, no, not really. Triple H said yesterday on the Pulse Media Scrum that they were never scheduled for SummerSlam. And yes, you know, your favorites, when they're not on the card, you get extremely frustrated and people think it's a gender thing. Oh, Rhea Ripley doesn't have a match. Raquel Rodriguez doesn't have a match. Trish Stratus, Becky Lynch don't have a match. <laughs> Everybody wants to be on the card at the same time. I'll say this with the utmost sincerity. A lot of the people, think about this, a lot of the people complaining in the last couple of days that Becky and Trish were not on SummerSlam were the same people that said this storyline sucks. So you weren't going to get it either way. And as Triple H said yesterday, you know, um, we want to give them a better platform. Plus, you know, with the stuff with Trish, as we talked about in the past, they wanted to give a little bit more time. So no, I mean, there's the people were not on the card. Sami Zayn wasn't on the card. Austin Theory was in the fucking Battle Royal, but you know, that really that didn't do anything. You know, there were some wrestlers that were not on this show. I mean, not everybody gets that opportunity. It's not the end of the world, you know? So, no, it's, you, you got to understand something. This is social media making a big thing out of a little thing. You know, and they think immediately, oh, WWE doesn't treat the women the same. We brought it up last week. SummerSlam last year, two women's matches. SummerSlam five years ago, two women's matches. SummerSlam 10 years ago, I think one woman's match. All right, they're not doing anything out of the, the norm. So, no, this is just social media getting their balls in a bunch just to get their balls in a bunch. That's honestly what it is. All right. Thank you, Steve. Sal Lomondola with the five spot. Thank you, Sal. Do I think that Adam Cole turns heel on MJF? No, I don't. No, I do not. I think MJF is going to turn on Adam Cole. And something that happened on Dynamite, I watched it back because somebody, I'm not going to lie, somebody told me 
like DT, did you pick up on something with MJF and Adam Cole? And I'm like, no. And I went on Twitter to see what some people were doing is when Adam Cole hugged MJF. If this is MJ, uh, this is a bad prop. If this is MJF's back, he did this, like to hug him. And he did the same thing in the past that's supposed to insinuate the knife to the back. Okay. No, that's not what I think. That's why Sal and some others may think that Adam Cole is turning on MJF. What I picked up on Dynamite was that Adam Cole signed the contract without reading it. And I have a feeling on Wednesday we may get a revelation that there is a fucked up stipulation in there against Adam Cole. And MJF reveals again why he's the devil. Maybe it doesn't happen this Wednesday. Maybe it happens next Wednesday. But as I've been saying all along, the MJF is the devil in sheep's clothing. He's the devil in sheep's clothing. We're getting a fun you know, run with him and Adam Cole. But at the end of the day, he's the devil in sheep's clothing. You know, sometimes you could bring home a snake as a pet. Sometimes you could bring home a wild animal as a pet. Remember that woman that brought a gorilla in a fucking house? And the gorilla lived with her for so many years. And then the gorilla got in heat and fucking tore her face off. You know, after a while, you know, the 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 wild animal, the devil, will reveal its true colors. So I still stick MJF heel. Why do you think MJF got to this point, the top of his game, by being a baby face? No. The reason why people love it is they want to cheer the guy for what he's doing. But at the end of the day, MJF, <clears throat> to me, is still a heel. He's still a heel. And I want to see what happens with that contract. I get this weird feeling there's going to be a revelation that's going to fuck up Adam Cole. Maybe Adam Cole can never go for a championship match again as long as MJF is champion. Maybe there's a wild stipulation that puts the advantage on MJF. I don't know. I don't know. I don't get paid that much to get those answers, but that's my gut feeling. So thank you for that, Sal. All right. Stick in. On the AEW front, Mike Rivella with a 10 spot. Got a question, an AEW question for you, DT. Who has been the most misused and who has gotten too much TV time? Huh. Well, well, uh, to me, the most misused remains the same. If you took a shot every time I've done this on the Wednesday shows, you'd be pissed drunk right now. Uh, Dima, How do you like it? How you like Miro's run on Collision so far? He's got what three matches? Tony Nice, um, Nick Camerato, and I can't remember the third one right now. That's what Miro has done in the last year. Miro's only had three or four matches in the last twelve months. He's been healthy for most of it. He comes back on collision and he's fought with all due respect wrestlers that are not even in the top 25. Nick Camerato and Tony Nice. How many months is collision on TV already? They have done crap with Miro. It is embarrassing. You know, people want to talk about the women's stuff, and I don't blame them. You know, the women solidarity against what you know was Lefisto had said and everything. That doesn't change the mindset of the people that are running that company. They might feel a little more pressure now, but you look at Miro, you know, it's the same shit. Powerhouse Hobbs. Powerhouse Hobbs. The fuck have they done with him? He fought Ricky Starks. What has happened since? Has he been on TV since he lost to Ricky Starks? I don't think so. Um, who has been gotten too much TV time? The first person that comes to mind, and I just had this conversation with somebody last week, and please do not get mad at me. This is not a shot on the guy. The guy has trained and helped a lot of people in wrestling, and he is legitimately a good guy. But as far as TV time goes, the one of the persons, he may not be the top of the list, but one of the persons that I keep talking about to people, uh, and Gress says Wardlow. Wardlow's an, another great example. 
another great example, but I think Miro is getting paid a boatload more than Wardlow. And Miro has been to the big time, the promised land, WrestleMania. And look how they're wasting him away. Wardlow at least still has a very long career ahead of him. Could still be repaired. For me, the person that gets way too much TV time, again, nothing personal, AR Fox. I just had this conversation about a week ago because there's a lot of Northeast guys that are now showing up in front of the camera and behind the scenes in AEW, and it warms my heart to see Kevin Matthews getting a job behind the scenes and Prince Nana. Come on, man. Fucking love Prince Nana. I've told this story on my show so many times that Prince Nana used to be the vendor for my credit card machine. And something happened. I don't want to get into the story here, but I was on the phone and I said, listen, I want you to hear something. And I took the machine and I threw it against the wall. And you heard the machine break into a million pieces. I said, you heard that? That's your fucking credit card machine. Come here and pick it up. Wasn't his fault, but funny story. I love Nana. Nana is such a genuine good guy. A.R. Fox, though, he's 0-9 on Dynamite. I know there's smoke and mirrors. Oh, Rampage, Ring of Honor, dark matches. He's never won a match on Dynamite as far as I know. He's like 0-9 or 0-10. And, and he's gotten how many title shots? Why is this guy getting that much TV time? Is he? Did he win and make a wish concert contest? I know he's a good guy. And I know he's, and again, I, I have nothing against him. But you see, can't get no TV time and fucking AR Foxes in trios matches this time. This time. Yeah, you know, they turned him heel. Okay, I want to see where it goes from here. But again, smoke and mirrors. Dynamite never won a match. Look it up. Thank you, Mikey. I'm curious, Mikey. You got to let me know next time who your picks are. Definitely want to see your picks. All right. Uh, we think we got one more. Dream 101. Thank you for the two spot. Dream. BL is great, but my gosh, WWE is coasting to me. Bloodline. Okay. I didn't know what BL was at first. Don't it, bleh. Bloodline is great, but my gosh, you know, you want to know something? Paul Heyman said something on the media scrum yesterday after SummerSlam caught my ear. And I'm sure Kevin and I are going to talk about it tonight. Paul Heyman said, now, if you follow baseball, there's nine innings in a game. Paul Heyman made a remark that said, we're only in the top of the third inning as far as the bloodline goes. I don't mind if the bloodline feud with each other until they retire. Stop with the belts beyond WrestleMania 40. When you hear Sheamus and others, you know, talking a little bit and saying that, you know, other people should be given opportunities. Do you remember my thumbnail from like three years ago? And the thumbnail had Bobby Lashley on it. I think it had Big E on it and it had someone else on it. And I said, be careful what you wish for. This is early on when they wanted to make Roman Reigns the champion of both brands. And I said, be careful what you wish for because people, you know, their shelf life is not for everybody 10, 20 years. Some people will get extremely hot, and that might be their only shot. And WWE has put this on such a level that nobody can break through, except for Cody Rhodes at WrestleMania 40. And, you know, this is an issue. You know, they pointed out yesterday that this is Roman Reigns' first match since WrestleMania for the championship. Technically, it's not. He fought Ray on a couple of house shows for the title. But still, you know, as far as mainstream TV goes, this is unacceptable. This is unacceptable. This is WWE's fault. This is not Roman Reigns' fault. This is the same thing that they did with Brock Lesnar several years ago when Brock wouldn't wrestle for months at a time. And everybody got angry at Brock. And I used to joke on my shows. Remember when I used to say, what do you think, what do you expect Rock to do? Just show up at Raw and say, hey, guys, I know I haven't been on TV for a month, but this one's on me. I just happened to be at the coffee shop down the block. And, hey, I figured I'd show up. Give me somebody to wrestle for 30 seconds. No, that's not how it works. This is WWE doing this. Right now, the bloodline is clicking on all cylinders. 
But it gets to a point where people are going to realize you keep adding chapters to this book. Now, we know Cody Rhodes is going to finish the story at WrestleMania 40. He's finishing the story at WrestleMania 40. He is finishing the story at WrestleMania 40. He's completing the story. Don't try to change it. But when does that chapter appear on TV? Survivor Series? Survivor Series? You know, if you read between the lines, they're telling you that the only championship Cody can win to finish the story is Roman's belt, WWE Championship. So when does that verbally come out of his mouth? Soon. Royal Rumble is probably going to be where it kicks in. Royal Rumble is not till January. We're in August, September, October, November, December. Four months. Four months. You know, January will be here like this. But four months is a long ways away. And what are you going to do in four four months? Bloodline four, Fatal 4-Way that Kevin and I have been talking about for a little over a month. We still believe that's happening. All right, so that eats up a month, month and a half. You know what's going to happen Friday. Is Jimmy going to explain his actions? They may tease it. They're going to tease Jimmy's returning to the bloodline. I don't think Jimmy returns to the bloodline. I think Jimmy Uso is still pissed off at Roman Reigns. I think the conversation Kevin and I had a month ago is that main event Uso is a selfish move. Instead of worrying more about Jimmy, Jay was worried more about winning the championship. So Jimmy is not returning to the bloodline. Jimmy wants to... You know, he's mad at everybody. He's mad at his brother. He's mad at Roman. He's mad at his little brother. And you saw Solo and Roman again, a little more full pot. SummerSlam, there's going to be a little bit there, and I think we end up with the fatal four-way. But how many months is that going to eat up? Maybe two? Maybe two? So we will see. We shall see. All right. Let's head on over to the chat. We still got about 45 minutes, so we got plenty of time to discuss. Um, Tristan is asking, in my personal opinion, what do I think is the real reason the Macho Man was blacklisted and why Vince McMahon never made up with the Macho Man before he died? I, I don't think it had to do with Stephanie McMahon. I know that a lot of people like to think that. I think it was his abrupt exit and... Listen, that Slim Jim deal and Macho Man and, you know, his role in the WWF at that time was very, very important. And Vince wanted him to be a commentator and Macho felt that he still had a lot left in the tank and Macho picked up and left. You take that, you take the, you know, the WCW that was in a little bit of a groove, not NWO, you know, I was still a little ways away. But they had a nice little groove and Vince, you know, steroid trial in 93. When did Macho leave? Well, steroid trial might have been 94. And Macho left, what, 95, I would say? 94, 95? So it was a combination thereof. And if, you know, Kevin and I used to joke about this before Macho passed away. Remember when Macho Man came out with the rap album, I think Be A Man? when it was all like a shitstorm on Hulk Hogan. At that time, there were rumors that Randy Savage could return to the WWE, but the amount of money he was asking for was too much, and Vince would not go for it. I remember us covering it. I remember definitely covering it on a Blackhearts hotline with Matt Zombie and Brian Damage. So it was more of the business side of it and uh, Vince felt stabbed in the back over it. I mean, obviously, we are not privy to the private conversations of Vince or Macho at the time, so we'll never know truly what every specific reason was, but that's the overall scope. And thank you, Rocky Red says he left in November of 94. Yeah, so that's not too long after the steroid trial. Remember when 9-11 hit? Remember when 9-11 hit and you had wrestlers giving a little 9-11 tribute and Stephanie said that my my dad she compared the trial to 9-11 like you know they they were at their worst and you know they, they got up and they prevailed I mean it was obviously edited out on future airings but you know the, that steroid trial 
was extremely, extremely a serious situation for WWF and Vince McMahon. If he would have been found guilty, I don't know what the future of the WWF would have been. I mean, I know a lot of people have podcasted over the years what they think would have happened that Jerry Jarrett could have stepped in or some others. You don't know. You don't know. Especially with creative, you don't know. Gruss gives an unpopular opinion that Owen Hart would have been a terrible world champion. Um, I'll say it like this. I was a wrestling fan since 79. And WWF slash WWE was my number one promotion until ECW came along because I lived in the Northeast. So we followed Northeast wrestling more than anything else. And I will tell you, from the 80s to the 90s, even when Bret Hart left and Owen Hart, you know, was jumping through the crowd and attacking Triple H and then exiting and this and that. Remember that? Even when he was in the nation, you know, me and my buddies just talking wrestling, we never, no one ever stepped back and said, oh, you know, Owen Hart would be an awesome world heavyweight champion. That's not a knock on Owen Hart. We never said that about Brian Pillman. We never said it on about a lot of wrestlers because at that time it was still the land of the Giants. Bret Hart, exception to the rule, even though, you know, he wasn't a cruiserweight, you know, but nobody for the most part, you know, now on social media, fucking anybody, could be hyped up. Hear me out. Hear me out. Unpopular opinion. You know, you make an argument for anybody. But at that time, honestly, even when we did the hotlines, you never ever heard us saying, you know, oh, they should put the belt on Owen Hart. Fact was, he was never in, con in con contention for that championship. Even when he feuded with Bret Hart, nobody seriously, for the most part, nobody seriously thought that he had a shot of beating Bret Hart for that championship. So, um, JS is asking, how did LA Knight win? He thought the dirt sheet said he had backstage problems. I don't pay attention to the dirt sheets. But I will say this. Did you pick up on the redemption at SummerSlam? Did you pick it up? I loved it. And it's in my synopsis when Kevin and I do the recap later on. LA Knight got to hit the belly to belly to Sheamus at SummerSlam. When he climbed that top rope and grabbed Sheamus, I'm like, yeah. Because people online couldn't wait to fucking shit on LA Knight. Like, oh, this is the guy that WWE is going to put the, the Jets behind from what happened on SmackDown. And then you had people overanalyzing it. Sheamus took a step back. And, fucking shit happens. It happens. People do slip up. But LA Knight got a chance to hit the belly to belly yesterday and nailed it. And that made me feel good. To me, that was in the top five of the spots of the night. And I'm sure a lot of people didn't even realize it. So um, James feels that SummerSlam uh, was very disappointing. Hey, that you have every right to have that opinion. I thought SummerSlam was their strongest card in history. And as I said earlier, yeah, there's been better matches in the past and better high-profile matches in the past, but as far as eight matches and seven of them being pretty damn good, six, you know, maybe the, 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 the Battle Royal and the MMA rules, not necessarily top shelf, but you get even three top matches on a card, you got more than you your money's worth. Um. You think back at the Royal Rumbles from years past. If I say to you, uh, what's your favorite Royal Rumble matches of all time? Most people will only come up with one, maybe two matches on a particular card. So the fact that we got as many bangers as we did yesterday, I thought it was damn good SummerSlam. Yeah, Michael, Drew McIntyre turning heel. I have that in the synopsis as well later. I said, pay very close attention to Drew McIntyre how he walked off yesterday after losing to Gunther, he was pissed off. Drew McIntyre is not a happy camper right now. And that has nothing to do with contract. So pay close attention. Drew McIntyre may end up feuding with Seth Rollins. That would be an interesting feud to go with, Seth Rollins. Why not? Why not? You got to move away from Judgment Day. Let Finn Balor concentrate on Damian Priest a little bit. So Drew McIntyre, it's a possibility. Um, maybe he doesn't turn full-blown heel, but 
Something, something's going to change with Drew McIntyre. When you watch him storm off yesterday, he was pissed. He was frustrated. Yeah, he could turn on Cody. Listen, I, I'm going to say this about Cody Rhodes. By the way, I have Coke Zero in the blue mug, and I have water in this. So I'm a little thirsty tonight. It's hot in here. Um, something that we're going to talk about later. I don't want to get into it now because it'll take a very long time to discuss. And this show's about answering your questions. But I will say this. Yesterday, when Brock Lesnar shook Cody's hand, lifted it up in the air, gave him a hug, and nodded, nodded. Triple H said that that was not part of the show. Brock did that on his own. I think the storyline twist in all of this is that Brock Lesnar, we may get this. I might be far off on this, but if you really, look, I know there's other podcasters that get 10 times the viewership and listenership that we get, but nobody comes close of nailing it every single time. And you know why? Because they concentrate on clickbait. They'll address backstage stuff with LA9 and this and that nine times out of 10 and the shit's not true. And then they're like, whoa, I didn't report that. I was just commenting about it. I don't even bring up shit that isn't true on these shows. I'll say this. Do not be surprised if we find out that Brock Lesnar did this to Cody as a test to Cody that you lost to Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 39. And the only way that you're going to overcome Roman Reigns the second time around is you have to prove you were not 100% ready for Roman Reigns. And in order to get through Roman Reigns and win it all, you have to go up against the biggest and the baddest, and Brock Lesnar was that guy. So whether Triple H put Brock Lesnar up to really test Cody Rhodes, or Cody Rhodes demanded, I want to be challenged to the max. I want to be challenged beyond my limits. We may find out that Brock Lesnar attacked Cody to get Cody prepared to beat Roman Reigns. And when Cody beat him yesterday and Brock nodded, that was his not passing the torch. People, that, oh, they're passing in the torch. Brock Lesnar ain't passing in the torch. Cody Rhodes don't need the torch from Brock Lesnar. It's not passing the torch. The storyline might be Brock Lesnar got Cody Rhodes prepared to go to the next level which will be needed to beat Roman Reigns. Remember that. Remember that. I'm telling you, we'll probably be right. Going back to the AEW route, Kevin Milwaukee says, Julia Hart was the only one in the group to get over. What makes everyone so gaga over the notion of Brian Pillman Jr. joining the WWE ranks? Because you got the WWE creative and the machine behind them. You look at L.A. Knight. L.A. Knight was tremendously over an impact. And how many viewers came in? When you get the WWE machine behind someone and the creative, and not only that, I don't like comparing AEW's training to WWE. But when you see the progression, I like watching NXT. I like watching the progression of Tiffany Stratton over the last year. I loved watching in real time Mandy Rose end up turning into one of the top women wrestlers in all of WWE. I like what where Lola Vice is going, and she wasn't even a wrestler. Tony D'Angelo wasn't a wrestler. I watch in real time, especially what the women are doing. So you see Brian Pillman Jr. being brought in. Instead of working dark and beating Lee Moriarty or Tony Schleppenhammer, you know, WWE's going to be like, no, oh, you're going to fucking, you're going to work your ass off and you're going to face Ilya and you're going to face Braun Breaker and you're going to get pushed to the limit and we're going to do the steady progression. And if you can't cut it, we're going to cut you. You know, Tony Khan, and this is not a knock on Tony Khan, but I want people to think about this. Tony Khan says, I won't fire anybody. I'll let their contracts run out. You know, you think for you and I, 
We know that we have a two, three year contract and we're not going to be fired. And we know we're not being used. We're like, fuck it. I'm getting paid. That's all that matters. And you really just, you know, you, there's a lot of people that will just coast because they know they got money. But if you're under the pressure that if I don't deliver, Bodie Hayward's the first one that comes to mind. If I don't deliver, Parker Boudreaux comes to mind. If I don't deliver, I'm going to get fired. So that pressure to perform and deliver or get cut, that is a good thing. That is a good thing. It's called lighting a fire under somebody's ass when somebody needs it, wants it, has to have it, knows they could lose it if they don't work hard. That's incentive that's drive and when someone knows that whether they work or not they're going to get paid for the next three years that's why brian pillman jr and wwe likely will be handled much differently than it is in aew bobby means thinks that trish uh, tiffany stratton versus nikita lyons is a mega money match yeah that's that's a good match i think Nikita Lyons was definitely on, on uh, the path of becoming the women's world champion, and she got injured. I think that will happen down the line. Absolutely. Uh, Nikita Lyons, you know, she's got the tools for NXT level. She's got the tools to be champion. Absolutely. By the way, I got to mention something before I forget. You know, it doesn't really have to do with NXT, but it might. You remember the watch parties that I was doing up until February? And then we stopped them. Well, this Friday, I'm bringing it back. Playback.tv slash Don Tony Show. I'm bringing back the watch party this Friday on SmackDown. If you've never been to one of my watch parties, there's a big difference in these watch parties. These are not watch alongs like on YouTube where you click on somebody's page and you watch the host talk for two hours for the watch party. You actually watch SmackDown. You watch SmackDown. You don't watch the host only for the next two hours. You watch SmackDown. So Friday, I'm going to bring it back. If you want to be part of it, I will be moderating it. I will be hanging out. I will be mingling and chatting. I will be on the floor talking about SmackDown, talking with you guys, ask, answering questions, whatever you want. But how the turnout is Friday is going to determine if we go forward with it. You know, especially now where the bloodline is compared to February. You know, if people still don't want to, like, hang out, you know, watch SmackDown and react live, if we get a nice turnout on Friday, then it'll continue next week. And I was going to do one this Tuesday for NXT because Dominic Mysterio is going to take on Dragon Lee and Rey Mysterio is going to be there. Rey Mysterio is good to go for NXT. So I was going to do one, but I thought, you know, on two days notice, I don't know what kind of turnout we're going to get. So if you want to join me Friday, that is the link. It is free. And if the turnout is not strong, then it's a one and done. I'm just being honest with everyone. Um, you know, it's, it's a big deal to do these things. And if, you know, people aren't going to show up, then we're not going to do them. So see what happens on Friday. Um, Matt P how many of the Wembley tickets do, do I think are comps? Realistically, a couple of thousand, I think at least a thousand, you know, I mean, Understand there's not many wrestlers who have relatives that live in that area. So you're not going to get that many wrestlers that are going to have, you know, comps to give away. But you could have local radio stations. You could have local stores. You're going to have workers be able to bring their their relatives, friends, you know, a, a couple of hundred, a thousand. I could see it. You know, maybe not as much because it is in England, it is in the UK, and not the United States. But, yeah, there'll be a lot of comps, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, when when my friend used to work for WWE, you know, you say, hey, you want to go? I got eight tickets. I got six tickets. I got four tickets. 
you do a, a low, some local promoting of the show. You give a handful of tickets. And, and especially when you're thinking about a building with 90,000 seats, you know, the tickets you give away could be in a boondocks. So it's not like you're giving away like box floor seats, but yeah, you could give away hundreds, nothing wrong with that. Especially the last day, if you want to fill it up a little bit more, you know, understand, even if you give away a bunch of tickets, you could get, you know, revenue from people buying merchandise. I get to go to a show. I didn't have to pay for it. Hey, I got some extra money. Let me go buy some merchandise. Maybe I'll buy a souvenir. So, you know, just because somebody goes to Wembley for free doesn't mean they're not going to spend money. So uh, Daniel's asking, do I think Hulk Hogan will have his final match? No, I don't. No, I don't. Could he be in the corner of someone? Yes. Uh, but no, Hulk Hogan... His, I, I had the same spinal surgery that Hulk Hogan had. And when I got that operation on my spine, I, this was not too long after me doing the managing stuff on the Indies. And my doctor told me, don't you dare take any more of these back bumps. Cause I showed him, he wanted to see some video of some of the things that I did. And he's like, you can't do that. Now imagine Hulk Hogan who actually wrestled for decades and put his body through crazy abuse and deterioration, you know, due to various reasons. I don't see Hulk Hogan having a final match. Sure, he could go to a Ric Flair route and just be more like a street fight, you know, and not take any back bumps. Yeah, I, Hulk, anybody could do that. But I don't think so, I especially because as he gets older and older, that risk of something seriously going wrong. Ric Flair, thank God he got through that match, but that was uncomfortable. For me as a fan, that was uncomfortable to watch. And people were embarrassed when Hulk had his Hulkamania tour in Australia. If anyone out there that don't remember that or did, never heard of it, Go look up the Hulkamania tour of Australia when he feuded with Ric Flair. And that was, what, over 10 years ago? And that was embarrassing. Um, So, yeah, I mean, he could have a street fight match. Look at Austin, and I think Austin is in better shape, obviously. But I really don't think a regular Hulk Hogan match, I don't see it. I don't see it. Loose Cannon Creations, play matchmaker. Who? What would be five matches that I feel a must at all in? Well, you know, I mean, you're asking me on spur of the moment to come up with five strong matches. I couldn't do that. Um, plus, you, I'll give you some things, but I'll say this. Look at what happened on Collision. FTR challenging the Young Bucks. Two days earlier. Oh, the Young Bucks are back in the tag team division. Before you could even exhale, suddenly he's they're taking on FTR for the tag titles at All In. So you see, like, there could be no build, no storyline, no nothing, and then two days later, boom, you got this. Look at Chris Statlander. I've been talking about this with the Jade Cargill push for a month now. She just overcame Mercedes Martinez. What's going to happen next week? She's going to wrestle nobody. Uh, or she's going to have a backstage interview, or she'll have a regular match. And then look at her car, Sheeta. She's going to take on Anna Jay. Well, that was the first match, and I, I don't give a shit. She's going to take on Anna Jay, which is a random match, and then maybe Wednesday somebody comes out and confronts her car, Sheeta, and boom, insta-feud. They do that with everybody. So my matches for All In are not going to be the matches that are going to happen. If MJF takes on Adam Cole, we don't know what the stipulation is going to be, so I can't even say that. Personally, what I will say is, is that if CM Punk calls himself the real world champion and MJF is saying that he has the main event at all in, CM Punk has to come out and say, I'm the real world champion. I'm the real main event at all in. And now they're saying that CM Punk may take on Samoa Joe. I wouldn't mind that match. Do I want to see that at all in? I don't know about that. 
because I I don't feel Samoa Joe is going to become the real world champion. I want to see a match where I honestly can't pick a winner. So I can't use that logic. About five matches that must happen. There are many matches that we could come up with that must happen in AEW, but the way they do things, you just get this and boom, there's the match. And you say to yourself, but why? I mean, you're not crapping on the match, but you know, look, look, we RVD. RVD was supposed to take on Jack Perry. People were saying it all in. It's going to happen at Dynamite. You know, so you can't come up with matches like this because the way AEW sets up their matches is not your, you know, traditional storyline build. They'll just have somebody randomly come out and have a confrontation and boom, there's the match. Samoa Joe and CM Punk was great not too long ago. Did anybody honestly feel that that would end up being an all-in or an all-out match as well? No. So, and I don't even think the Young Bucks should be taken on FTR. I don't think we, maybe Kenny Omega and CM Punk. Maybe Kenny Omega and CM Punk. Because supposedly Kenny Omega has been the most diplomatic, might be the right word, towards CM Punk. So I would say Kenny Omega versus CM Punk is a match I would like to see. I don't believe it'll happen for Wembley weekend, as I like to call it, but that's a match I think we should see down the line. Um, Ricky Starks, I like what they're doing right now. Does anybody truthfully think he's going to become world champion? I don't see it. I just, it's so difficult to predict some of... I will say this, Sheeta versus Thunder Rosa. If Thunder Rosa can go for Wembley weekend, Thunder Rosa's got to come out with her championship just like CM Punk did. She's got to come out with her own bag as well and whip out the women's champ. I'm the real women's champion. I never lost this title either. And let Thunder Rosa feud with Sheeta. That's what I would do. Maybe Jade Cargill comes back and she wants her rematch against Chris Statlander. There's a couple others. I, Mike says CM Punk versus John Moxley. I, I really don't want to see that. John Moxley has done, I, I'm not discrediting what John Moxley has done for AEW. The fans love it, but John Moxley's basically become just a straight hardcore guy. And honestly, you know, I, I, I don't think I want to see him against CM Punk. I think John Moxley is better suited for some crazy fucking. It would have been interesting if John Moxley was around 25 years ago, 30 years ago, when FMW was in full gear and Terry Funk and Cactus were in Japan and you had Onita in his prime, uh, Jinzei Shinzaiki and others. Uh, it would have been Hayabusa. It would have been really interesting to see John Moxley of now go into Japan at that time and work in death matches. It would have been pretty wild to see how it would have went down. But I I don't know if I want to see Moxley versus CM Punk. All right. um, Tristan is actually my favorite memory with Vince McMahon as an announcer. I, the only memory I have of Vince McMahon what I used to love about Vince McMahon as an announcer is how he would react with the George the Animal Steel matches. That's one of the reasons why I have the George the Animal Steel versus Pete Sanchez match on my channel from my own videotape from 40 years ago. I got VHS tapes that I recorded 40 years ago, still in a box right to my left right now. And Vince McMahon on commentary, not very good. But when George the Animal Steel would rip open the turnbuckle and rake the opponent's eyes with the with the the um the foam, and then George Steele would spit all over himself, I'd be I, you wouldn't see Vince's face, but you yeah ah, ah the eyes the ears ah like he would just get so like annoyed upset. And what George the Animal Steel, look at the spittle. He would say spittle. I think it's S-P-I-T-T-L-E. Vince McMahon would actually say, look at the spittle. That's my favorite memories of Vince as an announcer. And I'm talking like 80s, 
early 80s. You know, the 90s stuff and, you know, this stuff with Bret Hart and Austin later on. I mean, obviously, that's, to me, that's different. But Vince McMahon, before everybody knew who Vince McMahon truly was for the company, those are my memories. Those are my memories. Um, and go on my channel and just type in George Steele and li listen to that match. I think I have two matches on there. Just listen to Vince's commentary. Priceless. Priceless. Forget the womanizer that he is or was or both. Just watch and listen to it. You'll see what I'm talking about. So, um, blah, blah, blah. All right. We got about 20 minutes left. Wow, we still got plenty of time. Plenty of time. Benjamin says that John Moxley is a one-trick pony. I disagree. John Moxley, if he needed to wrestle, John Moxley could wrestle. But I don't want to compare Moxley to Hogan. But people will understand my point. You ever watch Hulk Hogan wrestle in Japan? And people will be like, I had no idea that Hulk could do all that. Because in the United States, fans didn't want to see him doing what he was doing in Japan. Fans wanted to see, you know, what we saw. With Moxley, fans don't want to see him chain wrestling. I remember one night in ECW, Mick Foley, as Cactus Jack, started chain wrestling. And he's wrestling him. You know, we hated it, but you couldn't help but to say to yourself, oh, he actually can wrestle. Nobody wanted to see Cactus Jack wrestle. Nobody, most people don't want to see Moxley straight up clean wrestling. Shout out to Alvy. How am I doing? I'm doing all right. Coming off of SummerSlam yesterday, which I thought was pretty good. Uh, tonight at 10 o'clock, Kevin and I will be recording the SummerSlam review and aftermath. So uh, we still got another show to do later. That'll be up for everyone late tonight, early tomorrow morning. Depends on what time we get done. Austin says I have the best impressions. I try. I try. Um, I got to start dishing out some other ones that I haven't thought about in a very, very long time. I don't want to be known for, you know, Road Warrior Hawk and Vince McMahon and Kermit the Frog. You know, there's a lot more that I can do. Um, Loose Cannon, once again, any word on what's being said about Roman Reigns not being advertised to appear for the next few months? Yeah. Um, these are the same people that say that Ronda's officially done and gone from the WWE. I don't believe that that's the case. You will see Ronda Rousey on WWE television again soon. Remember I said that. Um, you will see Brock Lesnar on TV. Maybe not right this minute. You will see Brock Lesnar soon, especially when they go to India, which is happening, I think, September 9th. Is it September 9th? I think they might be going to India. It's, they want Brock Lesnar on the card. Maybe he doesn't appear. Uh, maybe WWE doesn't use him. But no, Roman Reigns, God, guys, stop. I'm not trying to be a jerk. Stop paying that much attention on these bullshit news sites. They're all fighting for ad revenue. So they all got to, yesterday was the grace. Oh, guys, exclusive. A return is going to happen tonight at SummerSlam. And what did you get? Jimmy Uso, which everybody and their mother knew was going to happen, and Omas. Like, people they, they, people saying Bray Wyatt, Randy Orton, these are people fighting to get bubblegum money for ad revenue. Stop believing their shit. Just use common sense. The bloodline is the hottest fucking storyline right now. You think Roman Reigns is going to disappear for months? That's insane. Roman Reigns will be on TV very, very shortly. Obviously, Jimmy Uso, they're going to tease, is he returning to the bloodline? He'll probably interact with Paul Heyman first, and he will not show his cards. And then Roman Reigns returns, and then Jimmy Uso reveals that he does. he's not happy with anybody right now. Why would Roman Reigns disappear for months in the middle of this giant storyline? Don't believe that, man. Seriously. Don't, don't, don't believe it. Havili, shout out to you, my friend. Happy seven-month anniversary of being a channel member, member of the family. 
Favorite steel ca cage match for the WWE in the 2000s. The Val Venus versus Rikishi, the Hardys versus Edge and Christian, or Jericho versus X-Pac? Well, considering I don't remember Rikishi and Val Venus, the only time I think of Rikishi in a cage is when he fell backwards into a barn, a truck filled with hay, which was kind of goofy, but, you know, still, I wouldn't have the balls to take that spot. I would go with the Hardys versus Edge and Christian. They never really ever disappoint at that time. You know, maybe they set the bar too high with some of the other matches that they had done, but how could you go wrong with those guys? You know, even with AEW, even though I'm kind of played out with the Young Bucks a little bit, you go and you watch and see what they did with the Lucha Bros. You know, you see the old stuff with Santana and Ortiz and all that. Yeah, it's good shit. It's good shit. All right, we have a super shout out to give. Got to bring the, the logo back. Rizzo. What's up, Rizzo? Thank you for the 20 spot, Rizzo. He also thinks WWE is purposely leaking some information out there because Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt have supposedly been coming back since the night after Mania. Listen, there are websites. Kevin and I have had a good laugh about it. We talked about it on the... Uh, we actually did talk about it on the SummerSlam predictions that every month since WrestleMania, there's a couple of websites that said that Bray Wyatt's return is imminent. They posted it in April. They posted it the first week in June. They posted it the middle of July. They posted it two weeks ago. And I even saw things posted the last two days. Sooner or later, they're going to get it right. But again, a lot of these websites, with all due respect, the zeros and the others, Honestly, what sources do you think they possibly have? Really? What what contacts do you when it, listen, if they this is the mistake that a lot of these websites do. If they would keep the breaking stuff on a very low scale, that's fine. But when they try to insinuate that they have a contact in WWE creative or somebody that is close to Randy Orton or so you know that they're full of shit. You know that they're making shit up. They are guessing. They're looking at WWE's track record and said, oh, SummerSlam 60,000. They have to give us a crazy surprise. They have to give us a major surprise. It's SummerSlam 60,000 people. So they put it out there and then nothing happens. Remember, you know, big stipulation for the final match between Brock and Cody that we were going to get some of the Elders, I, we were just pondering, people were reporting that the elders would be at ringside for this match, that there was going to be some other things. You know, they're just, they're just guessing. I don't put any credence into it, man. Look, we actually, this is even better. L.A. Knight, L.A. Knight. If any of you out there that did not hear the prediction show for SummerSlam with Kevin and I, just go download it. Listen to the first 10 minutes, because it's not even SummerSlam predictions, but we talked about L.A. Knight, and we said, when L.A. Knight is losing matches on TV, you will see news sites report that management is not very high on L.A. Knight, that L.A. Knight doesn't get along all that well in the back, and they're not you know, convinced that he could be the guy. And then Kevin and I were joking and say, as soon as L.A. Knight starts winning high-profile matches, you're going to see goofs out there reporting that management is very high on L.A. Knight, and L.A. Knight is getting along with everyone, and L.A. Knight, whatever past problems he had, he no longer has. And literally, a day and a half later, you see a lot of these websites reporting that management, WWE management is very high on L.A. Knight, that they acknowledge that, you know, the merchandise sales, although they did the same with Miro, that L.A. Knight, whatever issues he had in the past are behind him. And it's hook, line, and sinker. could see it a mile away with these guys. So, you know, take their shit with a grain of salt, but don't believe it is gospel. Just ask yourself common sense-wise, why would these people have these kind of contexts? And if they did, how come they get so much of it wrong? You know, they, they don't. They don't. Even me. You know, I have some friends that work 
in WWE. I have a couple of friends that work in AEW, and if I want to find out something specific that's very important to me, I will ask. And they know that I won't just come up here breaking news. You heard it here first. Give Don Tony the credit. It, you must give credit or I'm going to get pissed. You know, I get my answers. But, you know, I don't break news anymore. I'd rather just opine instead. So take those sites with a grain of salt. So Rizzo with another 20 spot and a follow-up. Are all these teasers? WWE is doing with The Rock leading to something. I don't know if I'm the only one, but who noticed? But Corey Graves used the arms are too short to box with God line, which was the same line that CM Punk used at The Rock. I'll say this. I did hear the line yesterday. Um, CM Punk did not come up with that line. That is a line that people have used before CM Punk. Uh, Just because a wrestler uses it in the past doesn't mean that it's now off limits to ever use ever, ever again. And, you know, catchphrases have been recycled and it's been tweaked a little bit. You know, we joke even with Becky Lynch when she shows up, finally the man has returned or has come back to, you know, she doesn't say come back because that's what the rock is. She'll say, you know, finally the man has returned to Houston. You know, you tweak it a little bit to fit your narrative. Um, but I will say this. I'm a little surprised that the rock did not appear at SummerSlam yesterday. I thought that would have been a beautiful opportunity for Grayson Waller. Grayson Waller's been mocking The Rock. But now I think WrestleMania 40, much grander scale. If Grayson Waller does not have a match at WrestleMania 40, I could see him having a segment with The Rock. You know, understand what WWE is also doing right now that I know a lot of you have realized is they're going over and beyond. Like every show, they're giving a little bit more than you would have expected. It doesn't feel like they're coasting. Yes, they feel, they coast sometimes on Raw. But as far as pay-per-views or premium live events, I should say, they are giving more than what we have expected. Look at house show attendance. In one year, they've almost doubled their house show attendance. Yeah, some people could say, well, COVID's still a little uneasy a year ago. Yeah, I believe that. Me and my wife caught COVID a year ago, remember? We went on a honeymoon the second week of September. We came back, we got COVID. We got COVID in Florida. So a year ago, yeah, a little bit different. But the point is, they are over-delivering. So I think WWE also felt SummerSlam, we got a 60,000. We got the buzz. You know, Adam Rock is not going to boost additional sales, especially since it's going to be a surprise. John Cena, fun surprise. Rock, you advertise. Cena, surprise. Rock, advertise. So I think the Rock at WrestleMania has got to be a lock. They didn't do it in California. How do you not do it in California? So what are they waiting for? Until the Rock, you know, becomes petrified Rock? You got to wait until he's an old man? So I think WrestleMania 40, I think that happens, Rizzo. I think the Rock at 40. WrestleMania 40, that is not age. That will happen. I really believe that'll happen. All right. We got a five spot from MJ. Should Ronda have only signed a five appearance a year deal? He feels that she would have gotten more respect. Uh, No, you know why I don't say that? Because Ronda Rousey is signing a contract to make money and to feed her family and set her family for their future not for respect by the IWC. A lot of people within wrestling do have respect for Ronda Rousey just because she sometimes could be a human sleeping pill and just because sometimes she's not, you know, coming off that well on TV doesn't mean that she doesn't have a lot of her peers of respect. Um, Ronda Rousey right now in a feud with Shayna, even though the MMA match kind of was, you know, it was disappointing. Let's be honest. Um, she is probably had her best run now in her most recent run, what she did now with Shayna, And that's based on reality. And sometimes when you work with your friends, your close friends, and it's based on reality, it's easier to do. That's why I thought Shayna upped her game. It felt real. 
Ronda upped her game. It felt real. And I'm not talking about the match. I'm talking about the build leading up to it. Ronda Rousey, I think the, listen, with UFC and WWE merging, she's one of the crossovers. You absolutely will have Ronda Rousey in the future of UFC and WWE together as a team. Ronda Rousey will be back on TV. But for now, I think she makes another appearance or two. And then she leaves. And then maybe she returns in time for next year's WrestleMania. So by next year, everything should be a done. Should be done. Everything should be merged. Everything should be finished. But Ronda Rousey's got to do it for herself and her family, not for other people's respect. So, thank you, MJ, for that. Much love. Much love. All right. So we have five more minutes because after this, I got to get this online, and then I got to prepare. Because tonight at 10.05, Kev is going to be joining me. We'll be recording the show. Uh, it'll be on Patreon Live. But again, if you're not part of it, it's never a push to get anybody to you know sign up. But if you're not part of our Patreon family, late tonight or tomorrow, the recap will be online for everybody across all the audio platforms. So you'll be able to enjoy it. So uh, if you're part of our Patreon family, you join us live. And, you know, be part of the show as it goes down. Otherwise, just uh, check out DonTony.com or however you access the shows. It'll pop up in the feed. So, all right, let's wrap this up with like two, three more questions and get out of here. Kevin Milwaukee, is it better to be a Patreon member or a YouTube channel member? What's the difference? Well, let me say it like this. On Patreon, you get ad-free episodes of everything I do during the week. Every show that I do, there's ad-free episodes there. Second of all, Kev and I, we have a couple of years worth of DTKC shows that are there that you could download. So there is a little bit of a library. When Mish and I used to do shows, we did hundreds of shows together. Every show that Mish and I ever did on Patreon is there as well. Uh, there's old hotline reports. I mean, there's like three or 4,000 hours of content there that's never been made public. Every week, Kevin and I do a Patreon show um, for YouTube channel members, my Patreon show pops up for them, you know, especially since my Patreon family gets YouTube shows, we try to give a little bit back, but even not, if not for me, Kev has hundreds of his shows that he does for the last five, six years. It's there as well. Uh, there's a lot of people that'll do both. Um, but you know, to be honest with you, you know, if I had a choice, it's, you know, it's kind of a toss up, you know, on YouTube, you could become a channel member for $2 plus we do contests. So we try to keep a, you know, a little bit different on each one. So, you know, one thing I will tell you, we will never, ever try to take advantage of anybody out there. So you sign up on Patreon and you drop $5. I mean, there is thousands of hours of shows you could just download, even if you downloaded it all and then canceled the membership a month later. You know, there are hundreds and hundreds of episodes there that have never been made public. Uh, at least 600 episodes, maybe more. So, all right, Benjamin, someone told him that it's okay for Collision to get lowest ratings because the network's pet project and not Tony Khan's. Is that true? No, it's not true. Uh, the network wanted some additional programming. Uh, Collision was born. CM Punk is on there to have him on TV and not interact with the elite right now, which honestly is a problem that is going to, you know, backfire if they do not rectify things down the line. That is not a healthy thing. But no, um, this is not a pet project. Do Let me say it like this. Tell CM Punk that this is a pet project. Tell the House of Black and some others that this is a pet project. See, check out the reaction that they give you. These wrestlers are trying to make Collision the number one viewed show in wrestling because it's pride. is a lot of work. There's a lot of input. Obviously, Tony Khan is the final say, but they're not simply just going through the motions to appease Warner Media. No. No, a lot. There is a lot more than just this. And what happens if Warner Media 
If you go on that logic and Warner Media says, okay, you know, thanks for collision, but, you know, we're not going to renew it for 2024. What do you do with those guys? What do you do with them? How, what do you do? Even if CM Punk could coexist in the same building with the elite, who's going to get TV time? We just talked about Miro and Hobbs and some others that can't get any consistent TV time at all. Look at the House of Black. The House of Black have had those titles now for 150 days. And who they defeated recently? The acclaimed AR Fox and Top Flight. Like, come on. And you're going to put them on Dynamite again? And then who no longer gets an opportunity on Dynamite? Because it's just, there's not enough time. All right. One last question and we're going to get out of here. Uh, which is the bigger screw job, Bash at the Beach 2000 or Survivor Series 97? Survivor Series 97. It's not even close. By the way, I tuned into Dark Side of the Ring, Bash at the Beach. Five minutes, I tuned it out. A few people gave me a little heads up of what this was. This was an episode where really to have not much of anything. And if you can't get Hogan on there, who is probably the biggest part of this screw job? If you can't get the big names and everybody about, you don't do the, the episode. There is obviously, you know, bitterness between Russo and Bischoff and this person and this person, this person. I watch five minutes and I'm like, oh, come on, man. I, I mean, these people truly are trying. This is not the dark side of the ring. This is just. I don't know. I don't know. I just. Bash at the Beach 2000 was not very good. It's not a screw job. Hulk Hogan had a crazy ass legendary career in WCW by that point. Jeff Jarrett laying down. Why didn't they do the finger poke of doom for Dark Side of the Ring? The finger poke of doom or Goldberg's losing streak, getting zapped with a cattle prod. That's worse than. Why? Because there was a lawsuit with Hulk Hogan. They didn't even, they couldn't even mention Bubba the Love Sponge's name. No. Garbage. And I guarantee you that rating is going to be probably even worse than 150,000, 160,000 viewers. I bet you it's more like 130, 140 at the most. I'd be shocked if it draws a good number. That That's just garbage. So, all right. I'm going to get out of here. So I want to thank everybody for giving some awesome topics to discuss tonight. This this was a lot of fun. Now, I don't know if this will be the thumbnail for Monday, especially because, you know, Roman Reigns and Solo Sokoa are not on Raw. But this is going to happen soon, obviously. You know, and that is a Photoshop. You know, somebody asked me last night, like, I don't remember ever seeing that on TV. I said, yeah, because I Photoshopped it. So I actually, you know, I could do a little good Photoshop work when I put my time into it. That's not even a finished product, but uh, that is a little preview for tomorrow. But, um, hey, once again, uh, Kevin and I tonight will be recording the SummerSlam review. We're going to start at 10 or 10.05, and uh, we'll get that online as soon as it's over. Should be able to get it online right away because I already typed up some, the synopsis. Unless we get into any other topics that I'm not, expecting we should be able to get it up pretty quick so uh if you enjoyed tonight's show smash that thumbs up if anybody wants to join us on patreon it's patreon.com slash don tony but again don't feel like you gotta sign up it's gonna be online for everyone by late tonight tomorrow morning you know so and friday uh, let me put it this way i'd love to see you all join me friday night 8 p.m eastern playback dot tv slash don tony show it is free just got to show up you know some people have said to me well what if i show up and i just like walk away from my computer for two hours i don't care what you do but if we get a nice turnout we'll keep the watch parties going friday's really and look if we can't get people to tune in to see what jimmy uso is gonna do what la knight's gonna do what happens after austin theory retains the title against santos escobar prediction what happens with EO Sky? Now Kyrie Sane is on her way back to the WWE, and she's going to do a press release tomorrow. So we'll probably have some news to talk about with Kyrie Sane 
on Monday's post raw show. So, uh, you know, understand just because Kyrie Sane is returning doesn't automatically mean she's going to show up on SmackDown. Would I would not ho- be surprised if WWE put her on Raw. Even though we love the Kabuki Warriors, I ask you this question in closing to think about. We'll continue the conversation Monday. You look at that Raw roster with the women and Rhea Ripley as champion. And you look at the SmackDown roster now with Io Sky as champion. Where would Kyrie sign Kyrie Sane be more needed? In my honest opinion, it's not even close. The raw roster. You got Liv Morgan, Becky Lynch, Trish Stratus, which obviously Trish is going to be leaving soon. You got almost nobody that is feuding with Rhea Ripley right now. Liv Morgan is on the shelf again. Raquel Rodriguez, they're doing an injury angle. Kyrie Sane is needed more on Raw, even though we would love to see the Kabuki Warriors reform. And I think they could. Honestly, this is what I would do. I would reform the Kabuki Warriors and then have them ultimately dethrone Chelsea Green and Sonya Deville for those tag titles. And then that allows Asuka and Kyrie Sane to appear on Raw and on SmackDown. And maybe a cameo in NXT as well. That boosts up the women's roster on Raw like this. And it's not even a threat for Rhea Ripley's title when you think about it. So everyone be well, much love, and I'll catch you all again soon. Have a good night, everybody. Take it easy. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a podcaster. For me to live any other way was nuts. To me, those goody good people who work shitty jobs for bum paychecks and took the subway to work every day and worried about their bills were dead. I mean, they were suckers. They had no balls. If I wanted something, I just took it. I ran everything. I paid the bills. I paid the hosts. I even paid the masked maniac. Everybody had their hands out. Everything was for the taking. We always called each other good fellas. You would always hear from somebody. You're gonna like Don Tony. He's all right. He's a good fella. He's one of us. But if you're part of my crew, nobody ever tells you they're gonna get rid of you. It doesn't happen that way. There weren't any arguments or curses like in the movies. See, your haters come with smiles. They come as your friends, the people who've claimed they care the most for your life. And now, now that's all over. And that's the best part. Today everything is different. There's lots of action. I don't have to wait around for everything like everyone else. Oh, I didn't get the vaccine? Fuck you, vaccine me. Oh, your delivery guy has COVID? Fuck you, feed me. Right after I moved here, I ordered egg noodles and ketchup. And I got spaghetti with meat sauce. I'm no longer an average nobody, while they get to live the rest of their lives like a bunch of schnooks.